Morning folks, it's me again, that's Kirby Erner. I live in Portland, Oregon. And what we're looking at here is, I'm just scrolling back over my YouTubes to date. It was, uh, I believe in a November, I went to a so-called Jupiter Hotel. I don't know why I say so-called. It's a perfectly good name for Jupiter Hotel. It was called Secret Knowledge or something, but it, it was billed that way for marketing. It was, I mean, very clear when we got there and before that this was to help entrepreneurial artistic types. See, Portland cultivates an image of being artist friendly, kind of a place where people come to explore a creative career. But when rents get too high or other situations disappear, then the creatives move on. They have to, right? It's not even a choice. But Portland treasures that sort of category. So this was a, con a whole conference for that, to support people in that. And everyone there almost was younger than me. Like, I'm pretty old to be starting out on something new. But I found the conference galvanizing. And ever since, I've taken to YouTube much more because I realize of all the technologies at my fingertips, this is literally the highest bandwidth for reaching the most people. I mean, I've written a ton, and I love the Internet, so I started writing hypertext right when it became possible because I'd been dreaming of it. That's where, you know, you're really empowered to link everything together in different ways and blogging and all that stuff. That was a renaissance time for humanity. I'm not saying it's over. I'm just saying I took to it like a duck to water. Now this slide that we're looking at, I keep coming back to, I think it's one of the most important. It is right from Synergetics. You can see the copyright at the bottom. <clears throat> and I was very tempted in starting today's talk to just say, let's do the slides again, because it's been a while and it's a feature of my YouTube channel that Occasionally, I go through what I call my slide deck. I mean, a lot of us do this, right? It's not like, wow, Kirby, how'd you ever think of that? No, it's more like, first of all, wouldn't you want a slide deck too? So you could talk synergetics. There's two little synergetics out there. And that's pretty much a core theme here. And I think this, this diagram or drawing here, it brings to a head everything that's important because A, that tetrahedron, let's say, and this is stipulated in the synergetics, is going to be our unit of volume. And you're immediately not allowing it to vary in length, just to any, uh, any length that would be necessary to make it a unit of volume. Because you can do that, right? You can take any shape and make it be any size, pretty much, in a cartoon. You can say this tetrahedron is big enough to uh, hold planet Earth. Or you can say this tetrahedron is big enough to hold uh, a couple of ants or other small insects. It's up to you to use your imagination. And, you know, scale. We, we use the word frequency a lot in synergetics when we're talking about scale of something. And it can be confusing because are you talking about getting bigger and bigger as you have more units, like a thousand? Is that bigger or is that just more subdivided like with pixels you know it gets confusing because the monitor might be the same size as the last monitor but the resolution is much higher that kind of stuff that kind of stuff we talk about a lot and that's what we call frequency and then there's angle so you go into the bucky writings and he's always talking about everything's angle and frequency and you're like what are you even talking about and it's like shape and scale and shape is more platonic. You can abstract it away from the electromagnetic spectrum to a, to a degree to where you're just talking about the totally abstract shape, right? And that's when we bridge over from like physics to mathematics is when we drop all of what we call the secondary attributes. And we're just living in a sort of platonic space. And Fuller, like when he's talking to kids in Fuller's Earth, which is what the book club's reading now, I'm going to go on ahead with these slides a bit and come back to that one as I talk. I hope you took took in a, a first look, and we're going to come back to that. And I'm just going to say a little more. In Fuller's Earth, <clears throat> which is a very interesting little book, 
Fuller is quite the rabble rouser with these kids. In other words, he's coming to them as someone that they already have been told by society is really a smart guy. He's someone that they should look up to. You know, as a kid, you're going to be skeptical on that, maybe. But he um, talks to them about him as a kid and being boisterously um, contrarian regarding lines being straight, having thickness, all this dimension talk that we get into here in the slideshow. You know, can we have a geometry that's consistent that doesn't distinguish between zero, one, two, three dimensions or whatever? Can we change that at all? Or is that a lock-in now for the rest of the planet's history? Is humanity now locked in to X, Y, Z forever? Mutual orthogonals, you know, n-dimensional, right? Machine learning. Now, without any of that linear algebra being disturbed in any way, in fact, abetted, I would say, even helped, uh, you can still have other, like, sandcastles on the beach, as I call them axiomatic substructures upon which you build an edifice, if you want to look at it in those terms. You could also look at it as a tensegrity, how a subculture might hold together, including its rituals and so on. Of course, I'm back to this Kenneth Nelson original, this tensegrity. Me and Ken were friends then. as his first webmaster and all that. So, you know, but he wasn't a big fan of using tensegrity to just mean anything you want it to mean either. So we talk about that in this channel. We talk about a lot of cool cultural stuff. Paul Affoli, art, architecture. That's a coupler. So do you have associations on that? Have you been watching enough to think of it as volume one of the coupler? What is the coupler? How does it relate to mites? What about the quarter right? What about Somerville? What about Michael Goldberg? What about Goldberg's? Polyhedrons, the guy, mathematician. Uh, there's a lot of Goldberg's in the phone book. I'm talking about one in particular. He published in Japan, I think, quite a bit. So here we got, looks like nitty gritty math. It's hard to decipher if this would be the first time. <coughs> Excuse me, you're looking at any of this. And it may be. And that's how I treat my videos, too. Hey, maybe it's your first time. But, you know, if you're deep into a lecture at MIT OpenCourseWare, at some point, you just have to dive in based on where you were and not on that some freshman just walked in the door 10 minutes ago and we got to start all over. So I don't do it that way all the time. And I think that's probably why... I gave up on doing the slideshow again right now because there's so many places in my YouTube history where you can get me narrating the slideshow slide by side. This is the jump point uh, to where we're at right now. See this, there's a long tradition of having, like Kaylee Menger I think is where we've got it up to now, a determinant, okay, I'm talking linear algebra where you can get the volume of a tetrahedron just from its edges. You know nothing about its angles, coordinates. Just give me the edge lengths. How do you give them? Like in what order and so on. Okay, we can get into that. Kaylee Menger, well-known way to do it. And then Gerald de Jong comes up with this alternative. And it makes just as much sense. And there's maybe a determinate way to summarize some of this. He He's thinking on a train and he can't find his notes anymore, but hey, we've tested this. It works well. It's like the circuit has been through the circuit testing. And so, you know, Python and all that, and high precision and all that. So it's a way to get the volume of a tetrahedron, but it naturally spits out in what we call tetra volumes. And this is where, if we wanted as a culture to move into a more intelligent future. Now here I'm being a little polemical. I'm giving my opinions, my ideas. But to use the Bucky stuff to our own advantage and continue to use it, because I would claim that we've already used it a lot, but to keep using it, we need to put tetra volumes in American literature somewhere. And of course it's going to seep into the math culture. Like the math people are going to, what, down the hall there, they're talking about Emerson, Thoreau, 
and now all of a sudden they're talking about matrices and determinants or something. What are they doing in literature class to do that? Well, we're excited over here in literature because a kind of a American classic, a two-volume called Synergetics, got dumped into the public domain without much comment, except from places that you wouldn't expect, like Ed Applewhite. But he's like Mockingbird or something. It's like, is he mocking us? What? I mean, is this all here to undermine America? Is synergetics part of a plot to undermine undermine America? Now, you can tell I'm kind of sounding sarcastic now. It's infectious. But what if, on the contrary, he's a flagship futurist all through the 20th century, especially towards the end, not really right at the beginning, of course. No one's heard of him at first. Why turn our back on that if we're patriots, right? If you care about your country and your school is not doing American literature justice, well, don't you believe in social justice, right? And you're saying, well, we're working on other issues like racism and stuff. But Fuller wasn't shy about having views on race and class, right? He was not into politics that much. He says he doesn't like politics, but that's just because he thinks politics is ineffective compared to his methods, right? He thinks what he's doing is even more potent, you could say. He doesn't come from a victim position much, but he does think humanity is on the brink of self-destruction. And he gives us thinking that he thinks will help us go forward, right? So he's kind of an optimist, and that's why he gets written off as a utopian. But with all the dystopian, high-budget dystopian science fiction out there, why not indulge in a little tiny nano bit of even some positive futurism, right? Star Trek had that flavor, and that the humans were not at each other's throat that much. Um, they fight with the Klingons and stuff. So in a way, it all gets back to not getting along, but still, it felt like an improvement. And Fuller's world game and his approach to world affairs, it's not about world government necessarily, but it's not about the UN either necessarily. But I think UN is a great body of uh, institutions, FAO, UNICEF, UNESCO, all that. I have it hanging in my window downstairs, that flag. And Fuller worked on getting a geoscope anchored in the East River in New York, right outside the UN building, would have been... Kind of like the MSG sphere, like they're putting in Vegas right now. But lighter weight by a long shot. Different purpose, different design. And I don't know if he could have done that design. He, he was a great conceptual artist in some ways. One of the major criticisms you'll find is that Bucky took too much credit for the stuff that a lot of people did. And that's a useful whole section of your course. I'm saying there's enough meat and substance here that you can fill all kinds of classrooms with interested interested students and have them immediately start branching off in their own directions to study all kinds of interesting stuff. Just the, um, the critique Bucky has of our civilization that it's too rectilinear, too orthonormal, is sweeping enough that even if it's wrong, it's useful, right? And that's what I kind of emphasize on this trim tab um, essay here, that we can separate Bucky's work in that we don't have to originally or immediately agree with him that it's as important as he believes. But what is it that he believes is important? That's the two aspects. Is it really important? <clears throat> I don't know. Let's say no, I don't I don't think it is. But what was it? What is it? Mm, that's important. Just to get it right, just to figure it out. So I'm gonna start going backwards in the slides now because that's exactly what I want to uh, address. What exactly was he into trying to get across? And this is what we don't see. Now it would be very I've many times, I think, been critical of the math curriculum for not jumping at this and trying to bring more in more quickly. 
I'm talking K through 12, right? And college. But I think that's a little bit putting too much stress on a, a subject that you really are marching. It really is a march to the, to your future. Calculus, pre-calculus before that, algebra before that, big math wars in California right now as usual. Dr. Wayne Bishop, player, I used to fight with him figuratively in the math forum. In a great public archives there, I was a veteran of the math wars. But I don't want to put it all on the math teachers to, to do this because they're under such stress already. I'm thinking a blend of like computer science and humanities. Starting in the humanities where we just read more fuller for the fact of his not being dystopian for a change. And then we introduce more and more of his math but in the context of kind of like science fiction fantasies of the future. What I would call Martian math in my case. And how deeply we go depends on the teacher's level of comprehension. I'm saying with this slideshow, if you study it, you can go pretty deep. No one's going to laugh you out of the room as you didn't do your homework, right? So this slide deck kind of establishes a deep end of the pool. Now you can go deeper, a lot of you have, and jumped off into your own, like, physics theory of everything, all that kind of stuff. But I'm just picturing you as like a high school to college literature teacher. It could be a public school because I'm not just, I'm not going to surrender the ground and say, oh, this is great for some small experimental private school. No, I think, and I'm not thinking all public schools have to, to change at once. I'm not one of those, let's all do this, like all becomes impossible once you say it. Let's all do this. No. Public schools have to be free to be different from one another. That experimentation uh, ideology that we imposed or not imposed, imputed to the states, that they would each be a laboratory and ex where we experiment with new ideas, that's public schools too, right? They cannot afford to all obey a single master or even two or three. So there needs to be a lot of ferment in the public domain. A lot, right? And I talk about that all over the place. I'd be happy to come on any of your uh, channels or some of them. I can't do everything. I probably will taper off on my channel soon because I've gotten to the point where I've said my piece, really. I mean, new stuff keeps coming in. Don't get me wrong. I'm really learning a lot now about, uh, what, Tsarist Russia and more of my history, filling in holes that I have so many in my knowledge. So I'm studying, 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 but a lot of it is like I'm 90% learning stuff. Now this is that same slide. Let's just pick it here. I'm learning stuff and catching up on stuff, and I'm not that going to teach it as the best YouTube guy for those things, right? I'm not going to come on YouTube as a teacher of just any topic, right? geopolitics, whatever. I'll talk about my opinions or views, but just wanted to say in terms of what I'm good at and what this channel has defined, I think I've carved out a space where I can sort of say there it is, right? And then maybe start a new channel or something. So I'm, I'm, I'm rounding it out. I feel, I feel that's coming. And here's this important slide. Now, why is this an important slide? Because you're not letting the edges just be anything. They're set there for you. The edge of the cube is second root of two. And you know that for the volume of that cube, all you need to do is raise that to the third power, because that's what cubing means. Second root of two times second root of two times second root of two, that would be the volume of the cube. And then there's all kinds of proofs. There's things we can do, but we can, we can convince you over a time that that tetrahedron inscribed as face diagonals has to be a third the volume of that cube. There's simple reasoning in Fuller's Earth, but this is not a Fuller thing. This is widely known. This is XYZ, this is any coordinate system, whatever. Okay. So, how can we say the volume is 1 for that tetrahedron? Because 3 times 1 would be 3, so we would think the, the cube had volume 3. 
and how could it possibly? So that's exactly where I usually pick up when I do this slideshow in other um, episodes on this channel. I, I point to that, and it's why it's not trivial to just, because I started out saying you can just size any shape to any size. It's, it's too soft and there's not much constraints if you don't also control the edge lengths and say these edges are one, one diameter, or two, two radii, right? We have units, fill, spheres filling space, right? If they were kind of all different, if they're hybridized, but we could like treat them more like uh, atoms. And it's only the abstract centers that form, say, the IBM. The atoms themselves can be anywhere. So that's crystallography and stuff. That's where we branch into. We have a bridge to stem from here. So the math people are looking over at us in the literature world with our Martian math, and they're saying, wow, they're really doing some interesting math over there. I wonder why. What is their intent? And as the math STEMite, a STEMite we say, you're into the STEM subjects, you see that we in the humanities are building a bridge in your direction. It's like lowering a drawbridge from our castle to your turf. Interesting. And more of us are kind of coming out, and we're less shy in a way. Even as kids, we've seen all these slides, even as kids, some of us. And it's like, oh, so there are, there are more, more sandcastles on this beach than maybe my old public school told me about. But my new public school here in the 21st century isn't that closed-minded, right? can't afford to be, right, as Americans and all that, closed-minded. Like, I'd pay everyone a UBI just to learn Spanish. Or if you already know Spanish, UBI to learn some other languages, right? It's not like we don't, we, we put jobs, oh, we need a good-paying job. No, you need a good-paying, learn some stuff, right? It's like, that's work. It's work to learn some stuff. And you're like, well, I'm done learning. I went to school already. Well, that's all you're going to get paid to do is go to school because we really need you to learn some stuff. And here's some money for it. That's your job. Get learning, right? And that sounds patronizing and condescending to a lot of people, but I'm talking to myself. I need to study. And I want to be a truck driver. So I'm the guy who knows how to code, not a super genius coder. I'm a coder. But I want to go the other direction. They're always telling the truck drivers, you need to learn to code. Now there's a super shortage of truck drivers. And they're kind of laughing back and saying, oh, yeah, really? We need to learn to code? I'm saying, I want to be a truck driver. I'm too old. I'm 63. I'm not going to jump into trucking like that. But I have this thing called the Trucking Exchange Program, Trucker Exchange Program, where, you know, we're allowed to at least fantasize in retirement about driving from China to Turkey or Sweden to Sicily. I don't know. Being on the road around the world, not just as a tourist, but as a skilled driver with database skills. I'd have um, geodesy skills, you know, S3 type skills, GPS, G, all that, right? Exciting future for truckers, I think. So I'm like in my retirement, you could say, as a retirement in my own science fiction. Because I had this diary called Bismo Diaries where I was in a kind of like a truck. It's more like, um, well, it was totally my imagination. So I went all over uh, in kind of a nomad land before it got to this point where it's really become a lifestyle, not out of choice for a lot of people. Which is another reason I recommend studying your history and this kind of material not because we know it's important but because it's clear enough to be offered for you you to decide what well, how important do you think it is right so you can figure that out or work on that we just want you to know what it was right that's what i'm saying in my trim tab essay my job isn't like you must realize this is so important, right? I'm here to remind you how important it is. No, you'll figure that out. I'm here to just sort of, here's what we're talking about. You know, before we get 
angry and argue about it. Why don't we get clear on what it is? And so that's that's where I'm coming from. And I hope you have a good answer there now. In other words, a lot of the time we'll just say, oh, Bucky Fuller, geodesic dome which was important and is important. Are they unstable? I hear there's new computer models that <clears throat> suggest we should not build giant domes in the desert just as experiments. To check the computer model, partly. Let's check the computer model with some giant domes. You know, just skeletons, we can take them apart. But they could be for events, could go to Burning Man. I don't think they're that unstable that we can't build more. I don't know. I feel like there's some some uh, psy war again to discredit the Bucky stuff. And I've gotten good at spotting where it's coming from. But again, it's not me who's going to build a giant dome in the desert. I'm just saying there's a fantasy for you. Do a dune. It's not that expensive. Government could pay, I think. All right. <clears throat> Talk to you in the near future. Have fun with my materials. Please use my slides and let me know if you do. I mean, you don't have to, but if you want to take my slideshow, go on the road. Um, I'd like to see what it looks like, right? It's like singing a song I wrote, right? Do a cover, whatever. You don't have to wear a hat. Lionel wore a hat. You don't have to wear a hat. You don't have to be me. I'm just saying a lot of work's been done for you here. All right. Talk to you soon.